Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our forum, Sex Talk in the Ballot Box. I am your moderator. My name is Alexa Brenner. I use she, her pronouns. I work for Planned Parenthood Votes Northwest as a regional field organizer, and I'm based out of Olympia. I am joined tonight by four incredible students and advocates. We are gonna hear from each of them about their stories, ask them some questions about their experience with sexual health education, and please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A submission box, and we'll have some time at the end for questions. We are all here tonight because we love sex education and we wanna talk about how important it is that every single young person has access to the comprehensive sex education that is age appropriate, medically accurate and inclusive. We are on a mission to approve referendum 90 and allow the bill that was passed into law to begin to have a positive impact on students all over Washington state. And I can't wait for you to hear about why you should be voting to approve referendum 90 from these amazing people. So Erin, I'm gonna send it over to you. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Erin Wright. I use they and she pronouns. Um, I'm a senior at Olympia High School and I'm also a member of the Thurston County Teen Council at Planned Parenthood. So I first got involved in sex education policy when I was a sophomore at the beginning of the year. Um, at my high school, sex ed is a unit during a semester long freshman health class, which is pretty common, at least in my area. Um, so I'd taken it the year before. It was really bad. <laughs> like the curriculum wasn't inclusive of queer and trans students. It was overall not the best. And so over the summer, I did a bunch of research on Washington sex ed policy and like laws about requiring sex ed or anything. And uh, we, did, we didn't require sex ed at that point, obviously. Um, but also I found out that my school was not in compliance with the Healthy Youth Act which was a law passed in 2007 requiring that if a school chooses to provide sex ed, it has to be like, you know, medically accurate and inclusive. So we were providing it, but it was not very good, which is what I knew. <laughs> so I talked with the state director of sexual health education over email for a while. And then I ended up setting up a meeting with her and my high school's principal. And what we kind of came down to was that it happens in a lot of schools that the curriculum, like they have like whatever curriculum they're using, but they don't have to report that to the state. They don't have any responsibility to make sure that it's actually good. And so like legislation like the Healthy Youth Act doesn't really get to have as much of an impact because nobody's like making sure that schools are following it. And later that year I became a volunteer with Planned Parenthood Votes just because I had gotten involved with the issue and I was like, this is still not fixed. <laughs> so then I was asked to testify in the Senate Education Committee in favor of the bill that uh, R90 refers to. And it didn't pass that legislative session. So I did it all over again during my junior year. Um, and then we watched Jay Inslee sign the bill last spring. We were all like, woohoo, it passed. And then we heard about the referendum. So I'm still here pushing for it for the third year in a row. Thank you so much, Erin. And Caroline, I'm gonna send it over to you. Hi, I'm Caroline. I am a senior in high school. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am the Action Council team lead for the Southwest Regional of Washington for Planned Parenthood. Um, I have been working with the sex ed bill for the past couple of years now. Um, I am in the county, one of the most conservative counties in Washington. Um, a lot of the groups and the representatives that you will see, have seen um, in strong opposition to this bill, the groups that um, made it so we have to do this referendum come from my district. So um, as, a, as a teenager, um, these past couple of years, I have been um, creating um, intimate groups with Democratic and Republican representatives with the teens of their um, districts and panels to talk about the comprehensive sex ed bill. And I've also been a lobbyist on the state capitol for the past couple of years. Um, right now at the panel, I am representing the, the very negative ramifications when there is no sex ed. I did not have any sex ed ever. I have been in the Washington public school for the past 12 years. And because of that, um, I was 
very vulnerable to sexual predators. And this is a very common thing um, happening to many of my peers in my district, um, where we have just been, frankly, um, taken advantage of and um, failed by the adults in our state and by our representatives because they could have protected us. Um, we went to school to have an education and this was an education that they didn't feel worth me having and I was the one that paid the consequences. So this is a really important issue to me. This is the, um, this is the decision between having safe students and having them have a childhood and not have to worry about being so vulnerable to uh, sexual predators because they literally don't know what sex is and they do have never heard the word consent. So. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story and your, your intro with us. Samantha, I'm going to send it over to you next. Hi everyone, um, Samantha Cruz Mendoza. I'm currently a college student at Washington State University. Um, I hold a number of positions within student government right now. Um, one of my hats is ASWC Director of Legislative Affairs, um, the WSU Student Government Council Chair and WSA President, which is where I'm on behalf of the Washington Student Association, which represents all um, four-year public schools in Washington State. Um, we took a stance in support of this bill when it was going to the legislature to begin with, and it was mainly a, based on a little bit of consent because, as everyone knows, it's rampant that folks get assaulted on college campuses regardless of anything that happens. And um, leading back to that, there's a lot of issues that are associated with um, the victims themselves, but mostly it's just people don't understand consent, and a big part of this bill would be supporting people um, and getting them to understand boundaries and such from a younger age so that issues like this don't happen and there are less sexual assault on campuses and uh, people more protected. Um, also on the part that people should be more educated on what um, bodily anatomy is and just in general, having a better understanding of how everyone works regardless of how someone may identify and being more aware of everyone around us. Thank you so much. And finally, Kim, if we could hear from you. Hi guys, my name is Kim Fan, and I'm a first generation college student at Seattle University and I'm also a Vietnamese immigrant. I've been advocating for Senate Bill 5395 um, through Planned Parenthood since 2017 and Caroline Kaplan actually introduced me into volunteering there. Um, she's very dear in my heart because she really helped me with my sexual assault situation and she's really just been a pivotal person in guiding uh, with justice and just like comprehensive sex ed. Um, and so more recently I've also become a spokesperson for the R90 campaign and like I stated before as a woman of color and a sexual assault survivor Sex education is really important to me because I wasn't fortunate enough to receive sex education through my political system or at home. And um, also through Planned Parenthood, I've also lobbied every year um, with Caroline too. And then we also, like she said, many of the things she participated in, I did too, um, with the Southwest region of Planned Parenthood. But in addition to that, um, as we lobbied and talked to our representatives, I shared my story and I was able to um, convey how sex education is really important to me and other fellow peers because of my sexual assault story. And I even got the intention of the sponsoring um, representative, Senator um, Monica Stonier, and she reiterated my story on the floor when she was um, negating an, an amendment to Senate Bill 3395. And more recently, I've actually been talking to um, the sponsoring Senator, Claire Wilson, and it's been really touching and opened a lot of doors for me. But the essential thing is just like getting it um, throughout Washington State for students. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you to all four of you so much for sharing your story and your experiences. So with that uh, super exciting intro, we are going to get started. Erin, uh, I'm going to start with you. Why now? Why is now the right time to implement comprehensive sex ed? Yeah, I just feel like I don't know, it's been the right time because we've always needed sex education. We've just been kind of blocked from getting it at school. You know, I needed comprehensive sex education when I was in fifth grade and we watched a video 
that it was like a fear mongering movie about HIV, but even though we didn't know like what having sex meant. Um, and I needed comprehensive sex education in sixth grade when they split my health class by assigned gender so that the boys wouldn't have to hear about periods. It just, it goes on <laughs> for a majority, like for a large majority of my high school career, I have just been working on this bill and so that like, people can get the information that we haven't been getting so that, you know, my little brothers and their classmates don't have the same problems that my grade is. I, I feel like a lot of people have been saying like, oh, it's not the right time. We're in a pandemic and there's already enough going on. But I'm a student and also the daughter of a high school teacher. And from that perspective, I can see that every teacher in this state is like changing their lesson plans right now to accommodate for distance learning. And I feel like that makes it the best time to change sex education because if everything else is already changing, like why not add one more thing that's really important? Amazing. Samantha, how about you? What do you think? Now the, why is now the right time? Well, I agree with Erin in saying that it, it's been in the legislature for years and it just definitely has been the right time for quite some time. Um, there has been a lot of separation with it being very sexual education as it is. It's very limited, very heteronormative and very exclusionary to um, some groups that are not represented at all and are not like LGBTQIA folks are never given any sexual education that's relevant to them. And this leads to issues where they're facing um, just misconceptions that they might not know about. Um, there just needs to be a lot done, basically. It's just, it's just, there's a lot to fix, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, agreement with, with both of you on that one. Um, so, Kim, you and Samantha are college students. You are, have already been through school. You, obviously the time for, for sex ed is, is past for both of you. But as college students, why do you think this is something important for you to care about? Um, okay, as young adults, we are starting to explore the world independently and we're unbounded by parental supervision. And that doesn't mean that there's like a looming threat of consequences when we do make mistakes. Um, when this occurs, there tend to be fewer repercussions for people um, inflicting harm. And I feel like if we all receive the same building blocks of sex education, we can hold our peers accountable, um, whether that be by their actions made at, um, by accident or if there was an actual intention of harm. It's important that we cultivate a safe environment for ourselves as well as the future of other students. And I think that's really important because when you're on campus or at home, you want to feel like you're safe where you're at. And if you have um, uncomfortable in, uh, interactions, it can really lead to a lot of um, discomfort. And having like that building block of like just sex education would be really helpful. And then we all know that and we can just like count on each other and respect that. Absolutely. And then Samantha, as a, as a college student, what do you think? Um, the stance we took on this was based around affirmative consent because of the issue with sexual assault on college campuses. Um, there are there's certain programs of, for WSU's campus, at least. We have Blue Sex Reality Checks. We have Green Dot, which is basically a first year uh, program where everyone attends and listens to, um, sorry. Yeah, all good. Okay, all right, sorry, my dog's making noise. Um, but, uh, <laughs> not a problem. There's those programs that are preventative, but those are also given to people who have already established their whole um, career, basically, their 18 year old space is about a point. You're an adult, you've already studied the education you have, you have most of your ideologies and your beliefs already set and things like that are not really going to change but if you implement an education that has all the information all the facts and everything right from the get-go when you're a child and learning it through all the years where you're k-12 then it prepares you for college way more than a 60-minute like introduction on like the first week and then you never hear about it again absolutely um i i love both of those answers um Caroline, do you 
so a lot of a lot of what we you know we talk about is is not just sex ed but also healthy relationships. Do you feel like the sexual education that you received has set you up with a good foundation for dating and having healthy relationships? Um, so as I said, I um, I feel like I'm representing a lot of the people that don't have a voice. You know, these are children, and these are there are a lot of children um, right now currently. Um, that do not know they have been sexually assaulted because they don't know what that is in Washington State. Um, I'm a, that was me. Um, I have not had any relationships. I am, you know, extremely afraid of people. And um, that was just, a, it happened right when I was starting to grow as a, as a woman. And, um, and so that, that, that kind of, that hate come being, totally with your body is a really numbing, disassociative feeling. And no one was there to explain it to me. I didn't know what was going on. And so I had a lot of panic attacks that I didn't know what they were. And um, I, you know, there, there was no support. Um, and so I was afraid of people, not just men, but just people. I was afraid of my family for no reason, just touching. I, I mean, I still can't have like, if my friend comes behind me and hugs me, I mean, I just, I flinch and I have, they can't do that. I can't have anyone now touching me unless I initiate it first. And that's been very difficult for me. Now I'm 18 and I'm, I'm an adult and I'm very, really scared because I want to feel love and I want to know what that feels like when I grow up and I want to have a relationship and I don't see that for me at all. I don't know how I could ever get over this and I don't know how I could ever feel not afraid of being with a man as a um, heterosexual person. That is, that is definitely a story that I feel like other people have, have resonated with and I appreciate that you're able to share that with us this evening. Erin, it sounds like you've done a lot of research um, and less, less, maybe the research may have prepared you more. How do you feel about your future and dating and, and having healthy relationships? Yeah, I think I honestly, unfortunately, I definitely like related to a lot of what Caroline said because um, like even though I did all this research and everything, like that's really different than like having it be in a class, having it be like, you know, everyone around you understands it, you can ask questions. Like I had the like practical knowledge, at least some, but I didn't really get like how it all worked. And so like, especially with like reporting of sexual harassment, they didn't really like tell us very much about it at my school, um, which became a problem. Cause like during my freshman year, I was like sexually harassed by an older student in one of my classes. And I just, I didn't know what to do about it because they didn't like tell us how to report anything. And I didn't really like, I didn't have the tools to, you know, stand up to him or to report him or anything. I just, you know, ignored him. I was just like, um, okay, we're just gonna ignore this. We're just gonna continue on in Spanish class. I, <laughs> um, I just kept ignoring him. And then he was like, oh, well, if you're gonna ignore me. So he like reached under my shirt in the middle of class and tried to take off my bra. And that my teacher noticed because it was very disruptive as it, as it sounds. Um, and so she helped me report it. And at that point I was like, oh, okay, so this is how this works. But like, I didn't need those, those weeks of that happening. Like we could have stopped that a lot earlier. <laughs> um, also like after that, I definitely kind of, I don't know, like, became kind of more closed off, kind of like Caroline was saying. I didn't want people to think that I was like flirting with them. And so I was very like, very much like trying to make sure that everybody knew that I was not interested. But even with all that, like I multiple occasions, I've been had to tell guys and like some, like the same person multiple times, like I'm not interested in you. I'm also a lesbian, so it's, it's there's like no chance for you like come on please just leave me alone um like I feel like if I'd learned about consent and you know kind of just the basic idea that it's not okay for people to treat women and, or anyone as sexual objects I think I could have you know done something about that first boy and I think that would have you know sent me down a very different maybe like more self-empowered path Samantha, what about you? Do you think your personal sex ed 
experience gave you the foundation you needed to have healthy relationships and to date well? Um, definitely not. No, it was uncomfortable. It was very much closed off. There was maybe like a 30 minute time where we went over like the concept of sex and that was it. And just in general, there's like no, there's no emphasis on uh, like interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. And just like forming like the basis of like friendships and like, um, it's mostly abstinence based education. So it's not even in, like informing folks on and preventative measures and contraception that's available for those who do get started um, being sexually active at a young age. Um, yeah, it was it was horrible. Uh, my I went to a college was in a very college. I went to high school in a very small town where everyone was very much making jokes about everything, and then the our health teacher didn't even like go into depth on the situation on anything, um, and we spent most of the period just just doing irrelevant worksheets. Basically, I don't even remember something. I don't even remember like a full lesson that we had in sex education. It's it's really bad. <laughs> Yeah, sounds about right. And, and Kim, what about you? Um, I actually never received sexual education throughout my public school. Um, like throughout my high school career, I spent my first year in at high school in Springfield, Vermont. I didn't receive anything. And then I actually went to the same high school as Caroline and I also never received sexual education there. Um, but because of that, I it, it ultimately led me to a very unhealthy relationship with a person that I thought I could trust and um, a lot like Aaron and Caroline, my story really resonates with them as well because um, after I realized I was sexually assaulted, it was like for months on end, I didn't realize, but my body was experiencing signs of trauma. Um, back then I was a varsity athlete for hurdles and I couldn't be around my, um, my teammates because they would always make sexual uh, references and I would flinch and be really uncomfortable. I would like uncontrollably, uncontrollably cry at random times or just be in a state of um, the, uh, like disassociative. Like I just wasn't very mentally present or physically. And a lot of things just really shocked me. Uh, I still to this day, um, I have a very big fear of men. I, I notice I'm really hostile towards them. I'm, like my body language is closed off and I even um, act out kind of in a way to like show them that I am not interested and that I am not to be messed with and I know that's not very healthy but for me that is what protects me and um, I actually uh, I had a rough upbringing when we first moved to Washington State my parents my parents just got a divorce and I was moving like across the nation and because of that I didn't have a lot of attention from my parents and it was really rough so I reached out through trying to get a relationship and I did have sort of a relationship with this one person and he actually ended up um, manipulating me, gaslighting me, just using me for my body really. And I had no idea what was happening. And that's the person who sexually assaulted me. Um, and just like, like I said, I was just like really physically, mentally, intellectually, like academically, I was suffering. Socially, I distanced myself from all of my previous friends. The only person that I felt like I could trust was um, my therapist. Well, not even that. It took months to trust my therapist and to tell her the things that had happened because I didn't even want to face the things that happened. And like Erin was saying, she didn't even know how to um, go to get help for it. When I, I, when I initially realized I was sexually assaulted, I had to like Google it. I called somebody like the RAIN, um, the national uh, hotline for that. And Caroline also helped me too. She really answered a lot of my questions. She was really there for me when I couldn't trust anybody. And um, like I said, so when I started talking about my story, telling people, I found out that I wasn't the only person that was sexually assaulted by the person that sexually assaulted me. And a lot of my peers actually had the same experiences, although like it wasn't with the same person, it was still levels of sexual assault that were just weren't discussed or that they didn't even know um, were a thing of sexual assault. And that was really traumatizing because I was like, how can this happen? And like, nobody can care. Because when I was reporting my sexual assault, I had to talk to several police officers and they were really passive. They never did anything with it. I had to make multiple phone calls just to make sure that they wrote something down. But at the end of the day, nothing happened. Like the DOJ didn't want to um, follow up with anything. And uh, the person that sexually assaulted me would begin to like slander our names, but he, there was no repercussions for that. But we were tra basically silenced from our school district and also the police that we moved under, unfortunately. So 
that was just my experience with the lack of sexual education. Also, because um, I, I do come from an immigrant family. So my mother, on the agenda, sex was not on her mind. So I could not come to her. I just remember um, it took a lot of courage to uh, explain that I was sexually assaulted and what that meant and that the police might talk to her. So it was definitely very heart-wrenching, but it was, I, I don't know. <laughs> As I, I am just, out of all of this, I love the strong female friendships that are, are like the bond people. Obviously not a great circumstance to bond people over, but shouldn't, shouldn't be a reason that we need to be bonding with our, our female peers here. Um, Erin, I'm going to ask you, so you've been working on this for quite some time. Um, sex ed has been, has been your, your baby and you've brought it up to here we are at Referendum 90. After Referendum 90 is approved, what do you, what do you think sex ed's going to look like? I just honestly, just the thing that really kind of gets me going about this and I just think is so important is that I just want everyone to have the information that they need, like about relationships, about sex, about sexual health. Um, because if they don't understand those topics, like if they don't understand their sexuality or their identity, they don't understand like STI transmission, if they don't understand how to have a healthy relationship, like I feel like, I don't know if they can give like really informed consent to like, being in a relationship to having sex because they don't understand, like we don't understand like these other factors that are at play. And we also can't talk about them with the people that are important to us. Do you feel like your parents talked to you about sex and, and did they support you at all about learning about sex? No. <laughs> so um, just as an example, I guess, um, my mom didn't know I had started my period for I think like a couple months because I had just been taking pads and tampons from my older sister because I was like, oh, okay, well, we're starting this, let's, let's do that, you know, like going to swim practice with my tampons. Um, so all the, all the jokes people tell about, you know, like the sex talk, like the birds and the bees, how awkward it is with your parents. I just, I, I never got that. Like, it was just like, okay, well, that's how some people do it. <laughs> um, also, I didn't, I didn't like know that gay people existed until seventh grade, which was really interesting because I am gay. <laughs> um, so like my parents are pretty homophobic. So honestly, it probably is for the best that I never really had that kind of sex talk with them because I don't know how much of like actually relevant information I would have gotten out of it. So um, a lot of people when I've been working on like this legislation, they kind of argue against the idea of requiring sex ed in school, sex education in schools, because they're like, oh, well, it's the parents' responsibility to teach their kids about sex. It's not the responsibility of the schools to do that. Um, and like, I get that that's like how some families work. That's totally a great system, but like without having it at school, without having that opportunity, um, like I, people like me any anyone that's like in a similar situation to me just wouldn't get that information. But honestly, at this point, I did get more sex ed from Planned Parenthood than I did from school. But you know, that's, that's because it's not required. <laughs> yeah, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I know my mom is watching this. Um, the more the most I've talked to my mom about sex is since I've started this job. And I'm, I'm grown and I live in my own place. So I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Caroline, what about you? Have your parents been, have talked to you about sex or supported you in learning more about your sexual health? Um, my parents are, so my parents are from New York City and they moved here. And I, it's like, so that, that's why I wanna, they, they weren't like, they weren't homophobic and they weren't actively trying against it. I think they really just thought that this was education and that I would get it in school. Like, I honestly think that they just, which is right. Like they, they thought that like, okay, we're paying taxes. We're going to send her to the public school and she's going to learn everything she needs to know. And so I think they just, in their experience, that's what worked for them. And that's what I should have gotten. So no, I never talked to them about it ever. Um, you know, they still don't know anything about what happened to me, just because 
I didn't know until years later and it didn't matter then, but um, yeah. I feel like that's a common theme from people that we, that we talk to. Um, so I'm gonna ask a few uh, more rapid questions to, to everybody in the group. Uh, Samantha, what is the best thing you, that you learned in sex ed or what has stuck with you the most from your sex ed experience? Um, I can't even remember. I, I remember expecting to have like the whole like putting a condom on a cucumber thing that you see in like movies. That never happened. We never even got that. Um, I remember filling out the worksheets, but that was it. <laughs> there was nothing very like exciting or rem memorable about like my sex ed class because we went over like the most relevant things. Kim, what about what about you? Any anything that you remember from any sort of sex ed experience? Um, I got most of my answers from like Yahoo answers or just like random Google searches. Um, I actually have insomnia, so I, I just kind of lay awake at night. So I just always have these random questions. And I think I've learned the most um, about sex education probably through like shows, like TV shows, just like Googling things. And also probably Wattpad, ironically enough, um, when I was in middle school. Um, so I really didn't learn much besides um, from that. <laughs> Caroline, how about you? Yeah, I didn't have sex ed. So where do you feel like you got most of your information from? Um, so I, I've been working with Planned Parenthood since um, the past basically like five, four or five years. I, I still don't know much to be, to be very honest with you, which is unfortunate. So now I'm going to college and I, I only know really what I've been um, advocating for, but I don't have all of the, the information that I feel like would make me be safe, which also is why I'm so scared of still having um, any kind of intimacy because I don't think I know enough to be comfortable and feel like I have a safe handle on things. And Erin, what do you, what, do you remember anything from school or is it all of, all of stuff from your research that has stuck with you? I have, actually, I've had so many like random sources, you know, like I do want to say one thing though, um, Samantha, you said the thing about the condoms and we actually did that in my class with like like a wooden penis but our teacher specifically like before she told us we were going to do this she was like okay i need like five girls to volunteer and so like people were just like uh, okay and then she was like okay so we're learning how to put on condoms today and i'm like why did you only want girls to do that like who decided that that was a good idea yeah it was really interesting <laughs> but um i like this one experience i had that i i just i got a lot out of it it was a really great experience um we at planned parenthood there was this new curriculum that was like lgbtq focused sex ed and i was one in one of the evaluation groups while they were still like developing the curriculum um and like one of the activities we did we took this big stack of sticky notes and we were supposed to write down every sexual behavior we could think of, whether it was like, you know, like a medical term or like if it was slang, like anything was fine. Um, and so once we had them all written down, we put them kind of into categories of things that were similar. Um, and then we just like, you know, read them all aloud, talked about the risks that different um, activities uh, posed, and then also how those risks could be minimized. And I think it was just kind of like, it was just really powerful because I, it was the first time sex had been presented in such like a gender inclusive, not like the boy has sex with this girl. Um, and it was just like non stigmatizing. It's like, these are just like things that people do. Like, this is some of the words that you've heard used to describe these specific things. And so it was just, it was really, really cool. I've also gotten a lot from um, being in teen council because we have trainings every week. Like, like last week we had a training on like, anatomy, but we started off with like this giant kind of going into what, it, what does it mean to be intersex and like, how does that relate to sex ed? How can we incorporate this into our work? And so that has been like such a big help in getting more of that information. That is awesome. Um, okay, so if you could, if you all have a second to think about what is one like super important thing that you 
wish you would have been taught about sex in general. Kim, we'll start with you. Okay, so the question was, what is one important thing that we should have been taught? Um, definitely affirmative consent, teaching what domestic violence looks like um, through partners, even if like you're like gay or not. Um, uh, talking about sexual coercion because it, it looks a lot different than just like explicitly like saying like no it's also just like saying no and no over and over again and then them just still proceeding and then just definitely what healthy relationships look like because um, on my end because of my growing up as an immigrant and my mom not always being there and my education failing me it was just really important to learn about that because else like otherwise like we're just left to like search on the internet and that's not always foolproof so yeah. <laughs> Caroline, what about you? What's something important that you feel that you should have been taught about sex? Um, I would have really loved to just have the vocabulary. And I think that is like such an important and a very powerful thing to have like an, a word um, to put um, an action under. And so I really wish I would have learned what the word consent. I wish I would have been able to hear the word sexual assault ever. Um, I mean, I can't even... I can't even imagine how how bet how much better things could have turned out if I would have been so lucky as to be you know five or six years old and I've been in a class where the teachers had to say you're allowed to um, if someone if you don't want someone to hug you you're allowed to say no and that's called consent and you're able to always have that that would have that would have been so powerful for me. Samantha, how about how about you? Um, you don't have to have sex. That's my biggest thing. You don't have to. I know that even though we, it's never talked about because we never go over sex, it's like the concept of it being like so mysterious. It almost feels like it's a rite of passage for people and when they're growing up. And it's definitely not. Like you don't have to do anything you don't want to. And the thing with consent is understanding like what your personal boundaries are and what you want to do because not everyone is a sexual being and not everyone is going to engage and stuff like that and that's completely fine and just accepting that and just allowing people to like put that on themselves that they do not have to just begin with that all super super important and Aaron, what what do you think one thing if you could think of one one thing that you should have been taught what would it be I, I think that this definitely comes from what I wasn't taught, you know, um, because in my freshman health class, we, we like talked about condoms, you know, but that was it. So I asked my teacher if we were going to talk about safer sex, if neither person involved had a penis. And she was like, oh, don't worry. Lesbians can't get sexually transmitted diseases. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Whoa, where did, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and so I obviously knew that that wasn't true even like before she said that. And so I was just like, so, okay, we're guess we're just not going to get that information. That's fine. I just, I wish that we would have, you know, gotten that information more easily, like, and also not been literally given blatant misinformation by a teacher because that's not... <laughs> it's school where you're supposed to learn things like not just lies like it was such a weird experience i was like how did you get how did you get there like what kind of mental gymnastics <laughs> got you to lesbians can't get stds okay these are all very <laughs> deep answers that i i appreciate and hopefully everybody else in who's watching is thinking of oh i really wish i would have known this before i entered into the the world of sex um so a question that was asked that I would love it if everybody could answer. Um, we can start with Caroline. What are your hopes for the next generation of students who will have access to comprehensive sexual health education when this referendum is passed uh, by voters in November? I hope they'll be safe. Um, you know, I think that I totally get why sexual assault and talking about consent is an icky to topic for parents because they don't want to think about their children being sexually assaulted, but not talking about it doesn't mean it won't happen. And you're just making it more likely to happen and for your kid to be the target because they are so vulnerable because they cannot put to words what happened. And the 
um, the abusers know that and they know who's vulnerable. And right now, basically all of Washington students who are children who can't vote are vulnerable for to be abused sexually. And so I hope this new, I, I hope so much. And that's like been my motivation for everything is just thinking about if I can just talk to all of these awful Republican senators who are mean and who are, you know, just discounting my story, if that will just help and make sure that the next students never have to go through what I went through. If, you know, to have those, those pieces of knowledge that they get from their school to protect them sexually, that will make sure that they can have a childhood and have a, a safe and happy um, introduction into their sexual lives whenever they want. That would be so, so amazing. That would make all of this worth it. Kim, how about, how about you? Sorry, can you repeat the question? My dog was barking the whole time. No problem. Um, so what are your hopes for the next generation of students who will have access to the comprehensive sexual health education when this referendum is passed by voters in November? Okay, um, like Caroline said, there's a lot of stigma around like sexual assault and just like speaking up about it and like asking for help and just like um, having open conversations about um, just like being sex positive and like exploring like your sexuality at a young age and like what are the healthy, what healthy relationships look like and how to like prevent yourself from getting hurt or like getting sick. And I, I would really like um, the next generation to just break that stigma. So like overall, like as we continue to grow as in, like us, we're obviously aging every day. And so um, I want our kids and their kids to just be like more positive about it and just less like hostile and be like, oh, I never participate in stuff like that. It's like, or it's like, oh, that's like, you know, people can have their privacy, like, they don't have to tell everybody about their intimate um, relationships or whatever, but it's, like, it's not a secret, like, everybody, you know, not everybody, but most of um, people have explored their sexuality, and I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of, and I think asking questions is really good if you're just oblivious to a lot of things. It's, it really is not bliss. It just opens the doors to a lot more problems, just a lot more difficulties that you have to endure, and I just, yeah, it would be great to just break that because just, everybody having that basic um, knowledge about it and the, uh, the future just, it just lead to le less uncomfortable situations and I think that'd be really great. And Samantha? Oh, we'll go to Aaron first because it looks like you have the puppy. Okay, Aaron. <laughs> um, I think that like when I when I go into the classrooms to like do lessons for Teen Council for Planned Parenthood, um, I'm hoping that by having this throughout like all grades and like having it be something that people are used to getting when like when we're going into a high school classroom, um, people kind of like just take it more seriously. Like they're actually like, cause I feel like a lot of the time people won't ask questions cause we do like anonymous questions and they're like, oh, well, I'm just not going to, or they'll like just write jokes instead because they're like, this isn't a serious, this isn't like a real topic, you know, this isn't important or worth my time. Um, so I think that if, if people get the information like in steps and so they understand like, oh, this is like how to like treat someone nicely and you know, all of that social emotional stuff that's so important, if that can be built on, um, I think that it'll just like make all of it make more sense, you know? I'm really hoping that we can kind of actually get that information out and have people take it seriously instead of just like, oh, well, that's just, that's that one unit of health class that one time. Like, I feel like we, I want people to see it as something that's much more ongoing. Okay, Samantha? Um, I hope that people notice the difference for sure. Like having the implementation of the sex education in general that'll be all over the state will just create a huge difference that people will definitely notice. And I hope that people will talk about it because um, once you learn something exciting in class, you tell everybody, you tell your older siblings and then they tell their friends and everybody knows about it. Um, but I just hope that everyone just, just realizes that there is a difference with it and that they are more educated on the facts that are going on and that they spark an interest to do their own research as well and explore their own identities too when they are introduced to the concept. 
that <laughs> sorry <laughs> he's, he's very excited um yeah you know, even though you probably can't vote, we're glad that they are excited about sex ed. We all want to be equally as, as excited. Um, I am definitely going to uh, jump in and answer that one, too, that we want a bunch of safe and healthy people walking around Washington State, and that includes sexually, sexual health-wise, and just in their everyday relationships and, and the lives that they lead. Um, I am... So grateful that everybody has joined us this evening. I am not seeing any additional questions, so we can, um, I just wanna you know, leave you with the, I, I'm actually gonna read a question that we had that was answered, um, and I wanna make sure that just so it is acknowledged, we did have somebody ask about um, talking about the importance of uh, healthy sexual education and preventing sexual and domestic assault. And I believe Caroline and Kim both very, very bravely shared about why that sex ed is super, super important um, to, to prevent that. And then it looks like we actually have another question here. Um, so uh, we have someone who wants R90 to pass like the rest of us. And what can, what can they do to help? So luckily, I am here to tell everybody that if you go to approve90wa.org, you can get involved with our field events. We are making phone calls every week. We are dropping literature at doors, um, very COVID safe, contact free. Um, and we're doing it in cities all over the state to Eastern Washington, Western Washington, North, South, everywhere. People are, are getting involved because we want to make sure R90 is, is passed so Aaron can finally put this fight to bed and, and not have to worry about doing this all over again, but also because it's important for our, for our youth. You know, we are all voters and we are able to be a voice for the youth that don't, don't have one in, in elections. Um, we have somebody asking if they are not old enough to vote. Yes, you can still help. You can still be involved. You can still make phone calls with us. You can still do lit drops. You are totally able to, um, totally able to be involved and be civically engaged and we love to see it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, my favorite volunteers are usually our under 18 volunteers because they are always the coolest. Um, and if you wanna donate to support Referendum 90, we, um, if you go to the website, there's a, a donation link. We can, you, you know, always, always love to, to help with that. Um, we had a link dropped in the chat. If you want to sign up to volunteer, we can have somebody from our, our direct voter contact group reach out to you. Might be me, might be some, one, some of my colleagues. And if you want to donate or take a look at anything else, you can visit us at approve90watt.org. Um, I am, yes, I'm seeing that we've gotten, yeah, we've gotten through these questions. I really, really appreciate that we have everybody, um, who joined us this evening. Um, uh, just something that is a little, you know, a little jarring, um, ballots, are officially gonna start arriving in mailboxes on October 16th, which is 10 days from now. Some counties will be sending their ballots out even earlier, and we as voters owe it to students all over Washington to ensure their access to comprehensive, age-appropriate, and medically accurate information about sexual health in an inclusive and culturally competent way. Our youth deserve the information that they need to protect themselves from sexual violence, STIs, and unintended pregnancy, and the time to give them that information and the power to determine what happens to their bodies and their lives is right now. I want to thank all four of our student participants. I also want to thank the Washington Student Association and the ACLU and Planned Parenthood for the work and the support on this event. And I know I speak for all of the students on the panel when I say that we hope you join us and vote to approve Referendum 90 to ensure future generations of safe and healthy youth here in Washington. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening.